He served as SIL's International Translation Coordinator, and at the end of this year, he will begin working as Global Consultant for Bible Translation and Collaboration with Wycliffe Global Alliance. And he and his wife, Joan, live in Pennsylvania. Please welcome Dr. Harmon. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I've really enjoyed the presentations um, so far today, and I look forward to sharing a few thoughts with you now. One of the questions that motivates me in this presentation is, why are there still so many languages with, as we've heard several times already today, zero scripture? Doesn't God want his people to have his word? And um, this is one of the mysteries of life. But yet I think um, what I am firmly um, standing on is the sovereign purposes of God. And I will never have uh, what will be an adequate answer uh, to that question of why. Why should one part of the body of Christ have such abundance of translation and versions and other parts of the beginning or uh, almost uh, body of Christ have zero. Um, and one of the questions that also motivated me in my preparation for this is hearing certain people talk about, well, um, not very much is happening in translation during that period of time. And I don't know if any of you have read Moses Silva's book, Has the Church Misread the Bible? Um, fascinating book, and his answer to that is, well, yes and no. Um, yes, of course, uh, we, as humans, are imperfect, and there can be misinterpretation. But yet, we cannot just give a yes answer that the church has misread the Bible because that completely flies in the face of the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the promises that we have in the scriptures of what the Holy Spirit's ministry will be among God's people. And so, I've asked myself sometimes, well, has the church mistranslated the Bible? And I would say the same answer, yes and no. No translation, as we've heard today, is perfect. And even the uh, source texts that we translate from are still being improved, as we heard in the first presentation today. And one of the things that's encouraging to me is that we, as people interested in or participating in Bible translation, we are participants in a movement of God that comes from the very beginning of time. I would say that the first instance of translation was God communicating with Adam and Eve. How could God as divine communicate with humans? And so that initial divine human communication is, I think, the first instance of translation. And we need to uh, realize that we are part of what God is doing. And I was with a group of um, colleagues who work in translation organization, translation coordination around the world a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know, God's mission in this world is not all about Bible translation. We have been greatly encouraged by the writings of Andrew Walls, Lyman Sane, Philip Jenkins, about the role of Bible translation, but Bible translation is not the ultimate goal of God. The ultimate purpose is the reconciliation of everything to him and the restoration of shalom that everything be as it should be, and Bible translation plays a part in that. And throughout history, 
in this uh, overview. Um, we have this thing that we've referred to often as transmission. And we have a very, sometimes I think, a very narrow understanding of what the transmission of biblical text has been. Then we'll look at uh, translation and how this all feeds into mission. And I have some points to consider at the end of this. Is this what we conceive of as transmission? Someone copying or someone sending things out to be Xerox, like we saw this morning, uh, and the transmission of the biblical text. And what is this thing we call translation? Somehow these green things being turned into blue, or vice versa. Um, I was thinking in, uh, in Dave Brown's presentation that what we need to say is we believe in words to words translation. Um, rather than word for word. Um, we believe that we can communicate across languages. And this has been a part of the expansion and growth of the church or the increase of the Word of God, as we saw in the book of Acts, all feeding into mission. Well, as we think about transmission, it's instructive, I think, to consider the fact that what we refer to as the Hebrew Bible is something that came about very late in the transmission of that text, that what was written very early would have been written probably in a script very similar to what we see in the, the Gezer calendar. Um, this is from the 10th century um, before Christ, or perhaps in these um, silver amulets mid 7th century, and this script is not what we see in our VHS or VHQ. Um, this, um, as uh, Wagner said in his book, the change from Paleo Hebrew to square script probably took place between the 5th and 3rd centuries BC, and it probably have been hastened by the Jews who returned from the exile for their lingua franca or trade language in Babylon was Aramaic. And how does that happen that one script takes over another? And what we really see in our Hebrew Bibles today is an Aramaic script, not an original Hebrew script. But this is part of how the text has been transmitted, how it has come to us. Part of the history of, I would say, I would suggest to you this interest motivated by the Spirit of God for the people of God to always have His Word in a form that was understandable. And this required updating and editing and changing of the very Word of God. The preservation of classical Hebrew is inseparably connected with how the text of the Bible was transmitted down the centuries after a long period of formation in which the various texts were expanded, modified, and after the exile, adjusted in a variety of ways, and in which the Paleo-Hebrew script gave way to Aramaic square characters, the text of each book began to stabilize. And my trust and faith is, um, to sound too uh, frightening to say, it's not in the text. It's in our God who sovereignly has overseen the transmission of the Word of God to us uh, and to others throughout the centuries. And what if we were to consider kind of a play on the words here, transmission through translation? Whoever, do we ever really stop to think that the pages of Scripture themselves are, are full of examples of translation that we just read over without stopping to consider. Isaac sent Jacob to Pat and Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel the Aramean. Aramaic was being spoken in early um, ages of what we think of as the Hebrew uh, world, shaped by our conception of that text in Hebrew. How did Jacob speak to these Aramaic-speaking people? Did he, was he bilingual? 
did he wear an Aramaic? Uh, how about Joseph and all the interaction in Hebrew? Did Joseph speak to his brothers through an interpreter? I think he had to because otherwise his identity would have been blown. And it was in that moment when Joseph said, everybody out of the room, except for my brothers. And he spoke to them in Hebrew and revealed his identity. But we don't see that in the text. We don't have any traces of Egyptian being spoken in the pages of Genesis. So this is transmission through translation. Translation is very much a part of scripture as it comes to us. And how about the book of Proverbs, the inclusion of Egyptian Proverbs, I think one of the classic examples of what I would refer to as common grace showing up in the pages of scripture as um, Arnold and Bayer say in their um, introduction to the Old Testament that there's just too much of a coincidence here. Um, and as the final sentence says here, it's now virtually certain that the instruction of Amenemope came from around 1200 BC, over 200 years before Solomon. And they would have been originally in some variety of Egyptian. But we don't have Egyptian, thank, um, thank God, in our um, Hebrew Bibles. But it's, it's there in Hebrew. But yet the origin of these Proverbs is Egyptian. Translation. Um, in the process of transmission of the Word of God. And much to every seminary student's delight, the fact that Daniel and Ezra are bilingual and force uh, some of us to not only study Hebrew, but Aramaic as well. And um, so here again we see the multilingual environment in uh, the pages of Scripture. And how about the different theories and um, that are talked about of the Aramaic or Hebraic, shall we say, world out of which the New Testament in Greek emerged. Translation, transmission of the Word of God to us through translation. And I'm not going to dwell on each of these, but um, as we saw also in the initial presentation today, the multiplicity of textual traditions that we, as we look at what we refer to as the Hebrew Bible, there is a diversity behind that that shows the care of God through his people for his word coming to us. And we need to be aware of this. Also, the Greek versions, the Septuagint, or set to a gentle traditions, perhaps we should say, because there is not one unitary Septuagint. Um, and what about the Greek version of Aquila, of Symmachus, of Theodosian, and what a guy Origen was, um, pulling together his, this hexapla, six versions, um, an incredible feat for his time, way before uh, Mac books were available. <laughs> so, just amazing. Uh, if you've ever had a chance to open a copy of the Hexapla, just try to absorb the amazing scholarship and the concern that there was for the Word of God being coming to his people in a faithful way. Then we have the Aramaic, uh, Targumim. Uh, best examples of the Targum of Ankalas and the Pentateuch and Jonathan on the Prophets. What motivated the Targumim? The people of God needing to understand. Language was changing. People were speaking Aramaic more than Hebrew in many places. And so uh, this process of transmission, even as Jesus talked with the very um, favored disciples on the road to Emmaus, wouldn't you have loved to be there that day and just 
listen in on that conversation as Jesus said, uh, explain how the scriptures spoke of him. Um, fascinating to contemplate and think of this, but Jesus himself being involved in this transmission of the meaning and the, um, the biblical message um, to his disciples. And we see Paul and Timothy involved in this, where Paul writes to Timothy about teaching these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. And we see these examples of transmission right in the pages of scripture. But one of the things we find throughout history is the incredible diversity of the context into which the transmission of biblical text is taking place and we move to translation. And we all have a very, um, sometimes rather simple um, definitions of what translation is, but to really define the phenomenon of translation and what translation does takes a lifetime. We might say, oh, it's communicating from one language into another, but what that really involves is uh, mind-boggling. And one of the things I'd like to suggest is that the ancient versions are often discussed for their value as textual witnesses to what we call the original text but they have value in and of themselves as evidence of rich transmission and translation history of the sacred text. Ancient versions, uh, Syriac, here we have some overlap with the presentation earlier this morning. Syriac in the mid second century, Latin starting toward the end of the second century. Coptic, third century. Gothic, fourth century. Armenian, early 5th century, Georgian, mid 5th century, Ge'ez or Ethiopic, uh, late 5th century, Nubian, 6th century, Arabic, 8th century. I think I've even read of references to an Arabic translation of parts of the Septuagint. Uh, Sogdian, 9th century, Old Slavonic work of Cyril and Methodius. And this is one of the things I'd like to um, highlight in this uh, consideration of this history that obviously we've just blown past centuries of translation. And each episode in that would be very instructive as we consider the history of translation and transmission. This says on uh, Wilkins, uh, the first thousand years, um, these brothers, Nic um, Cyril and Methodius, went to Rome and they stopped in Venice where they met stiff opposition to the use of Slavonic in the liturgy. The local bishops and clergy informed the two brothers that there were only three sacred languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Cyril would have nothing of their linguistic impurities. And one of the things I would like to suggest from this, and this history of early Bible translation, is that views of language played a great part in the translation history through these centuries, just as views of language today play a big part in what we see in the modern era of translation. One of the maps that has caught my attention um, probably made more public or popular by the publication of Philip Jenkins, uh, The Lost History of Christianity. Um, this is a three-fold map of the world uh, from the early centuries. And one of the things that I appreciate so much about publications like this is how we are recovering a greater understanding of the fact that Christianity has been global for a long time. We are not the first ones to see a global expansion of Christianity, even as we saw earlier today the examples of um, early translation or incantations in Sinhalese. 
of early efforts in translation. And as uh, Jenkins writes in Lost History of Christianity, by the seventh century, the Nestorians had an elaborate network of provinces and dioceses in Persia and neighboring lands. And as it continues to say, this stretched deep into Central Asia into the far western territories of what is now China. And one of the considerations here is that we can tend to transfer our current political map of the world onto the world the way it was then and not realize that the history of the world and the movements of history go hand in hand with translation history. And the rule of empires in the early centuries of the growth of the church played a very big part in the translation history, and we need to be aware of that. But the multicultural focus of the world of translation has been, I think, brought to light um, in recent years in a way um, never before seen. In Bible translation, as um, Sane writes, hitherto taboo ethnic groups and their languages and cultures were effectively destigmatized, while at the same time superior <coughs> cultures were stripped of their right to constitute themselves into exclusive standards of access to God. In affirming weak and stigmatized languages and cultures, Bible translation gave fair to Western cultural prerequisites for membership in the human family. Bible translation breathed new life into local languages and equipped local pop populations for participation in the emerging new world context. This action results from Bible translation being based on the idea that all languages are equal in terms of their value and right in mediating the truth of God, but that by the same token, they are all equally inadequate in relation to that truth. No language can claim exclusive prerogative on the truth of God, just as, conversely, no language is intrinsically unworthy to be a language of faith and devotion. Some of the main points I'd like to have us consider uh, from this whirlwind view of the history of transmission and translation is the sovereign rule of God in human history. And that is where I rest. Um, not in my questions of why and why not. Um, because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And toward the end of our um, scriptures, we see the same Spirit and the bride saying, Come, let anyone who hears this say, Come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. The waters of chaos transformed into uh, the water of life. And the sovereign movement and action of the Spirit of God from one end of history to the other. But also we need to realize that there's a non-uniformity of human history. One of the definitions of being human is that we change. We cannot assume that we could just go back as we are today to 500 years before Christ. People were different then. Neuroscience demonstrates that people are shaped by their context. And we cannot assume that history has been uniform. History is non-uniform. And one of the ways we see this, um, this is from Ping's uh, Pressure Points. And he writes here about how even conceptions of nation, nation state, and other constructions that we have as humans are changing. 
and he makes the point here that, um, as he says in about the fourth line, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations was understood to be the going into a geopolitical area of the world. And as long as some people became followers of Jesus in that country, then that nation was reached with the gospel. However, in the mid-20th century, many began to question this interpretation and started advocating that the Greek expression, ta ethne, was to be understood not as countries on a map with their national boundaries, which are known to change, but as ethnic groups. So when we read in the pages of scripture that there will be people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and language, what do even those terms mean? Do they mean the nation, the national entities that we see on our maps today? What was the concept in uh, John's mind as he wrote that in the pages of uh, the Apocalypse? But God is active in all human history. And he is active in human history. He is the one who designs the flow of history and the interconnectedness of all human endeavors because God is the master at bringing all things together for his purposes. So I don't understand why there were a certain number of translations in the first eight to ten centuries and I think I have some ideas of ways that the interconnectedness of history has contributed to the modern era of translation. But we cannot claim to be the engineers of what of this movement of God. We are participants with him in this movement. And in closing, translation and transmission or transmission and translation, as it says, go where the church goes. This is a clear lesson from the history of the church that transmission and translation go together in that constant desire to have scripture, the sacred text, the Word of God in an understandable form wherever the church has gone. And transmission and translation go with the flow of history. The change of empires to nation states, to the modern era of discovery, to the modern era of uh, what we refer to as this globalized period, these are all things that God is using in his purposes to bring his word to his people. And transmission and translation are deeply embedded in culture. There is no process of translation or transmission that is outside of or independent from human culture. And this is because I would say transmission and translation are both incarnational. And the translation of, as we heard also again uh, earlier today, the translation of the divine into human, that Jesus became the fullness of God in human form is an act of translation which is incarnational so that the text trans transmitted through translation speaks in our ever-changing contexts in the global mission of the church. If the text were not, if this, and if translation and transmission were not embedded in culture, it would have no connection to us. It would be alien to us. And it has been part of the mystery and the wisdom of God that all of this process has been 
incarnational. And it's a privilege to be a part of what God is doing, either in proclaiming or in uh, participating in the global movement of Bible translation that God is um, promoting in this world that is under his sovereign control. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. This was very, uh, uh, very interesting. I wonder if you, if you would like to comment on the interplay of, uh, of different cultures in, in transmission and translation. We, uh, I think our, our simplistic view, you know, would see our understanding of biblical culture through the academic enterprise and then transmitting that or translating it for us so people who are somewhere and being cognizant of their culture. But there are layers. There is not only what we understand of, uh, of the biblical culture, our own culture and here in the United States, tinges and affects our understanding. And there is a national culture that in some ways stands between us and a people group, uh, in your case, Chile and in my case, Indonesia. So how, how do you see those kind of things? Uh, the interaction of those different layers of culture with regard to translation, anything in your own experience that you could uh, share? Well, it's a, um, I mean, there are areas of, of possible response to your question that may sound rather unsettling. Um, and I think one of the ways in some of my own uh, notes and reflections on this whole topic of translation has been to, um, I, I'm not ready to publish this, um, but is to have a graphic that represents the um, Hebrew text and then an equal sign and um, picture any modern English version that you uh, would like to put in this equation, and then question mark. Is it, is it possible to say that any given English version or a translation done in language X is equal in every single way? to that Hebrew text. I see several of you, thank you, um, shaking your heads this way. Um, I think in uh, Mike Walrod's presentation, uh, the very powerful evidence that we see from um, the cognitive, the difference in cognitive worlds in which we live. I do not inhabit the cognitive world of Abraham. And yes, we believe, and I would say I firmly believe that translation, faithful translation is possible. Given the understanding that God himself is the author of human language, God himself is the one who made this whole creator-creature distinction between him and us as humans. And just as the very definition of human is to change, I'm not willing yet to say that, therefore, scripture changes. But yet there is not a complete equal sign between what that text was in that world and what the biblical text is today. Understandings develop, and I think we see this throughout the history of transmission and translation, um, said in a very provocative way. Uh, Sugir Taraja, one of the writers um, in post-colonial biblical criticism, says, every generation recreates the Bible in its own image. Now that sounds rather extreme, but yet 
Um, I think it's an area that we need to wrestle with and realize that as um, one of the a prolific writer in the field of translation studies um, says in a book, um, Scandals of Translation, that uh, Lawrence Venuti writes that no one can translate with gloves on. Uh, we always, there's always some trace, there's always some fingerprint of the translator in that translated text. But that to me is part of the cultural embeddedness that God set in motion himself so that there would be a direct connection to us in our world because translation is incarnational. So hopefully that got at your question. Anyone else? Mike? I'll just follow up a little bit on that comment and uh, uh, I want to do this because two or three uh, young people have approached me since I made my presentation and since I ran out of time before I got to some of my punchlines. <laughs> um, and, and what you say is right on. None of this takes God by surprise because he's in charge of it all. He created all of these contexts including the diversity of cultures and languages in the world. And, and so when we think of inspiration of scripture, God was in control of all of that, including the need to translate it from some of these original languages into languages and worldviews that are so radically different. Well, <coughs> so what are some of the controls? Uh, Lam and Sana has done a masterful job of pointing out um, some of these things. I wish, uh, I wish you all could know him. He's such a a brilliant individual who understands this plan of God as few people do, of how uh, indigenous theologies will develop because people approach the biblical text with an entirely different, um, you know, none of us come with a blank slate, you just come with a whole different set of assumptions and understandings about the world that they must, must bring to the interpretive process. And so, um, what I like to, uh, and I, I mentioned to one or two of the people who were asking these questions, is refer them to Psalm 19 and Romans 1. And in those two passages, it talks about how God just bombards us with knowledge and information about himself. And that is the backdrop that all of us, no matter what language and culture we come, come from, bring to the table when we interact with his communication to us. Right, and there's a mystery, and this is part of saying that translation is incarnational. There's a mystery in the incarnation of how is it possible for the divine and human to be one. And that same mystery uh, for me applies to scripture. It's a mystery of the divine and the human um, in, in and through scripture, but yet God is the one who sovereignly oversees the whole. Yes? Uh, I'm sitting here just thinking on this. I'm, I'm seeing as, as we're talking here, when we talk about translation, especially in English language, we go from Wycliffe and the King James. What I'm seeing is God meeting the need to people throughout history. Mm -hmm. It is stick with just one language of this King James. We all speak in that language. And so since I'm hearing all this, I'm seeing that you know the need for Bible translation is to start hearing the needs of the, the people. And that's what I'm this is what I'm hearing. You sit here absorbing all of it. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that point because it, um, of course this is easy for me to say because it connects with something I said earlier, that the point is not Bible translation as an end in itself. Bible translation is one of the means that God is using, has used, and is using in the world to bring people to himself 
as part of this ministry of reconciliation that we have been entrusted with. And Bible translation is just one aspect of that. So. And I'm going to follow up on one, uh, one more thing. We, as we are talking, I, it uh, brings to mind the, the sort of the nuanced interconnectedness of hermeneutic and translation, uh, and how how these things are so closely tied, and, and something where we have to be as a translator be very aware that the uh, uh, one volume uh, uh, commentary, the Africa Bible commentary, has been tremendously revealing for me in terms of seeing. Uh, seeing scripture that I'm very familiar with through somebody else's eyes, uh, a very different, a very different, you know, cultural milieu, as, as Mike has said, and how they can see things. Jenkins brings the same point out there. They see that people from a very different cultural uh, background can see some, can draw something. Through, you know, the Holy Spirit can reveal things to them that we are that we're going to because of our background. So. All right, thank you.